All right. Eric, thanks for being on the show, man. It's, it's great to, to connect with you again. It's, it's been a little while since you and I were together the first time we met. and We've kind of bounced back and forth and a couple of things. So I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy man trying to figure out all the craziness that's going on like everybody else right now. So I appreciate you being here. No, thanks for having me on. It's so great to hear your voice. Yeah, thanks. Um, let's jump in here. So tell everyone just a little bit about your background, your, your story. I know when I first saw you talk, uh, we were together at Hitachi, right? Remember that? It, in, uh, was that in Vegas? Yeah, yeah, no. In Vegas. In it's Vegas, like a whole yeah. world. That's right. And, uh, but I heard a little bit of this story. I think it's probably worth retelling. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I'll give you the short version. We can dive any avenue you want to. But uh, my name's Eric Quammen. A lot of people call me Equal Man just because it's first initial. Last name spells out Equal Man. Uh, but my whole career, I've been on the digital side of things. Back before, it was kind of the cool thing to do. I was at Yahoo when they are tiny. I was the head of marketing at Travel Zoo, which you took public. Hmm. But what I've been doing for the last 10 years is I primarily write books centered around digital leadership and what's going to happen. Like, what's going to happen next? And most importantly, what do I do now? So kind of looking ahead, but never being a, a year ahead of your market, but always a year ahead of your competition. Mm. And so I've been always been fascinated with the digital side of things. And obviously, all things are digital. So the last 10 years, I've just been diving into what digital leadership looks like. That's cool. Tell us a little bit about your uh, athletic background. Yeah, I was fortunate. I went to Michigan State University. So in high school, a lot of you have watched The Last Dance. And so the one commonality I have with Michael Jordan is I was also cut from my high school basketball team. So was I, actually. So, I don't know if you knew that. I got cut from my <laughs> high school basketball team, too. <laughs> there you go. It's a good thing. It's a blessing. I guess so. Now everyone's going to go out. Good. You got cut. Good job, son. <laughs> good job, daughter. Awesome job. Getting cut. Now you can go on your greatness. You got that out of your way. Uh, so that's awesome. I did not know we shared that. So that's yeah. fantastic. Uh, but I got to Michigan State. I still loved. I mean, I love basketball. I mean, my in eighth grade, I even wrote a magazine called Swish Magazine. So mm -hmm. entrepreneurial spirit back at the time, even then. But I got to Michigan State. I became the manager, which is really a glorified name for the water boy. Mm -hmm. And I just kept kept that dream alive. And so I kept working out in the summers. Then eventually, I was able to walk on the basketball team and get a scholarship at Michigan State. So that was an awesome experience. Um, and I see Coach Izzo at least once a year. He always has reunions. Um, and he's made the Hall of Fame as a coach, but he's even uh, more of a Hall of Famer as a person. So it's just been a real blessing for me. Yeah. What year was that when you were there playing? I graduated in 94. Okay. And did you guys, how did the team do when you were on the team? Were you guys, I mean, were you there or in the hunt those years? We always like to say we paved the way for the national championship. <laughs> but my, my freshman year, we did. We were ranked number one in the country, primarily because UNLV, if you remember that team with uh, Larry Johnson, Anderson Hunt, oh, they were yeah. on probation. Oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, we were always solid. We were always top 20. And uh, there were seven guys from the team that went on to play in the NBA. So, Oh, wow. A lot of talent there. And then, obviously, Coach Izzo just took it to a whole nother level yeah. as he moved forward. So, that was great. That's cool. What, uh, what are some things that a lot of people don't know about you? Anything that sticks out that, that you highlight? Like, for instance, myself, like, I do three things left-handed. I, and I don't – it's only these three things. I, sh I shoot a rifle left-handed – I shoot pool <laughs> left-handed and I play the guitar left-handed. Those are the only three things I do left-handed. So it's a lot of people don't know that. <laughs> oh, that's pretty awesome. Um, for me, I guess it's just an oddity. I didn't think it was that odd, but I actually like coffee the third day it's been in the pot. So at home, <laughs> I go, don't let, don't let, don't, your mom comes over to visit. Make sure she doesn't throw that coffee out. Cause I think it gets, Thicker, darker. I like it like motor oil style. So I don't mind drinking a cup of coffee for a week, a pot of coffee for the whole week. Now, is that it, – it's it's warmed up, I'm assuming. It's warmed up, yeah. Then at night I unplug it. Then the next morning I just warm it back up Throw again. Back I unplug it. And, yeah, so. Does coffee have a long shelf life? I wouldn't even know. <laughs> well, you do have to be careful because I have had a roommate. If you were to leave it 
like just leave it for like a couple of weeks, there would be mold that grows on the top of it. So. Yikes. That one you stay away from. That's funny. <laughs> so I know your next book, I want to talk a little bit about it. I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, it, it's your, your, your writing. It's going to be coming out soon. I'll let you talk about it here as we get going. But um, your what's interesting is that the focus of the book is around focus. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts on why you felt like focus was the next journey for you as you kind of write your, your next book. Yeah, for me, I always like to start with a book that has a readership of one, meaning that this is a book that I need to read. Mm. So if anything else happens, I can actually always go back to my book for reference from the research from the self experience that I go through writing it. But what I discovered is I kind of started to go, wait, I'm successful, but how do I become more successful? It's holding me back. And I go, it's, I've got way too many things I'm trying to do at once. I'm trying to parallel process all these things. Would I be better off just focusing on one thing at a time? Hmm. And so it's one of those things that as you journal, as I lay awake at night, I said, what, how cool would it be? How relaxing would it seem or how great would it be if I just focused on one specific thing per month? Could I do that? And as I went through that process in my mind, as I went across speaking at the time, not right now, obviously, but around the world, and you know this firsthand as well, one of the best things, Ryan, you know this specifically, is when we're in the green room or we're to work with a company and we usually deal with the CEO you have the opportunity to pick that person's brain yeah. and ask them, how did you become so successful? And the answer almost all the time was, I have the ability to focus better than most. Hmm. And I go, you've got 10,000 people on your team. This is crazy for me to think about. How do you manage 10,000 people? And, and I go, what's the biggest challenge you have each day? And they go, it's maintaining that focus. So it was the same answer. Focus is what set them up for success but it's also the thing that challenged them each and every day. And whether I talk to a CEO or a school teacher or a stay at home dad or mom, it was the same answer. And so I realized that I wasn't alone with kind of this focus quandary. How do I focus in this unfocused world? And when I think about what I deal with the digital tools, it was almost an anti venom to my book, social dynamics, my first book, which is still the best seller of all the books I've written social dynamics. It's kind of an anti-venom that. That book was telling you, hey, social media is not just for kids. It's going to change the way you do politics, everything, business. Yeah. Unfortunately, that kind of came to fruition. <laughs> so this is the anti-venom of this, you know? Hey, yeah. we're too much into our phones. Here's how we focus in an unfocused world. And now with quarantine, it's interesting because then we pushed, we held the book when this happened because we go, wait, this could be really helpful for people as we start to work our way through this and hopefully out of this. How do I get back to focusing not on the busy, but on the big things? The silver lining of all this, it was a good reminder to us, hey, life's short. Focus on the big things. Don't get enamored by the little things. That's easier said than done. And so our hope is that, that book's really going to help people um, guide them through it. And it's actually a project that I took on for 12 months. Each month, I focused on something different and then graded myself on how successful I was and then married the research that we had, like I'd test, hey, does essentialism really work or is that just good for books? Mm -hmm. Or does stoicism really work or is that good for books? Does this really work? Let me test it out. And so we would kind of, I would be the guinea pig and go through it. Hmm. Did, did you guys do any research on, and I'm just curious just for me and, and I think those that are listening, did you guys do any research on the power of focus and as it pertains to athletes? High, high, even high level athletes? We did. I mean, there's a story that we pulled in the book where Andre Agassi, he obviously his nemesis was Pete Sampras, but right. they'd walk through the videotape of him walking on center court. And it's before he hit a ball. If you look at his body language and his focus before he got on the court, you could tell, you go, which match did he win? Which match did he lose? And you can tell within a minute, just looking at the video, of how he enters center court, comes out of the tunnel. One time he's running, he's bouncing on his feet, and his focus, his mindset is, I don't know why this guy even showed up. I'm going to kill this guy. Mm. 
The second one, they asked him, hey, this is the match you lost. And you can tell just by looking at your body language, you look like a 50-year-old man, even though you're prime of your career, you walk out of the tunnel. What are you thinking? He goes, I'm thinking how bad and how hurt it felt when I lost this guy, which is Pete Sampras, the last time. And I can't go through that again. So his focus was already on the loss. And so, yeah, we get into that. There's um, near and dear to our heart. We just talked about basketball. They've done studies to where you actually can take a group. They took three groups, and they had one group practice free throw shooting for 30 minutes a day. They had one group just visualize practicing free throw shooting, making shots for 30 minutes a day. And they had one group that did nothing. They stayed the course. They didn't practice or visualize. And it turns out that the mental visualization group, as well as the group that shot the free throws, outperformed the group that did nothing. And the mental group often outperformed the group that was practicing, but not proper practicing, meaning that they were kind of just shooting for 30 minutes. They weren't really mentally focused. And so yeah. definitely we do get into it from the athletic side. Um, and obviously with your background, as a gold medalist and also your coaching background and playing and your na national title that you understand that better than most that sometimes the mental aspect's more important than the physical. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. I tell people all the time, it's the mind that pushes to the body. It's not the body that pushes the mind. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, people that truly understand what it takes to be in a mental mindset that allows them to perform and succeed are, are really the ones that are going to be doing things at another level. I get people that ask me all the time that the, the question I get is, Hey, were you nervous before the gold medal match? And, um, I put myself back there because, so we were in Beijing when we won gold where before you go out into the court, you're kind of in like a little hallway, just waiting to kind of walk out onto the court and you're with the other team. You guys are just kind of there together. And, and I remember thinking to myself, like, it's almost like I wouldn't allow myself to get too wrapped up in the moment of what was about to happen because we had a team where none of our guys had ever played for a gold medal. This was the first for our whole entire team. Then the team that we're playing against, like 75% of their team had already played for a gold. And so I think people wondered if, if that dynamic made it nervous for us and I can't speak for the other guys on our team, but for myself, I I just took it as this is another match. Look, you guys, look, we've been here before. You know, we've, we've played hundreds, even thousands of these. If we go out there and play our game and do what we're supposed to do and know what we can do the right way, we're going to be successful. And, and that's kind of the way it happened for us. I felt like we were very steady that whole match. Um, it was actually the guys on the other side of the court, our opponents, that started freaking out at the end. And, um, and I think that all kind of boiled down to a really steady mindset and focus around what we were, what we were wanting to do and how we were going to go accomplish and execute. So I, I totally relate to what you're talking about. And that's interesting. Now, when you go on stage, if you're about to go on stage and speak to, say, 5,000, 10,000 people, do you get nervous before you go on stage to speak? Um, he, he, this is another thing I'd want to pick your brain about because I think it's interesting. If, if I feel like I'm prepared really well in regards to what my message is, you talked about being kind of in tune with whatever client that you're with, understanding their needs. What, what are the 5,000, the, the 500 people in the room that you're going to be in front of need to hear from you? If I'm, if I'm really well prepared in understanding and knowing that I can deliver that message, I, I, my, my, my fear level or my hesitancy level around what I'm about to do is dramatically reduced. If I'm not as confident and prepared in what I'm about to go talk about, I tend to let anxiety override me a little bit. And I, I do sense a little bit, but so that to me, the, the preparation aspect of, of being confident in the messaging is really what overrides the the fear factor. No, that's true. I mean, for me, before I go on stage, is that I'm always I'm always nervous. But like you said, if I'm more prepared, then obviously a lot of nerves come in. If I'm not prepared, then I'm really nervous. Non-preparation could happen because the flight was delayed. I'm tired. Right. Something weird happened. Yeah. But 
I always am a little nervous. What I try to do is I take that nervous energy and just transform that word. So kind of like a focus trick. All right, that's not nerves, that's energy. So once I turn that to excitement, so I turn that word from nervous to excitement, and also they go, that's what I'm going to leverage. Because a lot of people tell a speaker that not used to being on stage and more people would be rather be dead than speak on stage. They'd rather die. They're less afraid to die than to give a public talk. And people tell them, hey, don't get nervous, don't get nervous. I tell them, get nervous, but change that word to excitement. Use it to your advantage as much as you can. And so, um, so it's fascinating, the different approaches for sure. Yeah. What, um, I'm sure you, deal, you delve into this a little bit in the book. What are some hard tactics that people can institute or work on to become better at focusing? You know, you talked a little, a little bit about, you know, getting really laser focused on, on important and specific things. Is there anything else that people can do to, to get better focused? Yeah, I think the best approach is to, A, make sure you know what you're focused on. I know that sounds simple, but with what Ryan, you and I do when we work with a company or an organization or a school, you ask what success look like and make sure that answer is similar across the board. Cause you can talk to a superintendent at a school and she thinks this is what success looks like. Then you talk to the multiple principals under their guidance and their success, they think it's different. So they're not on the same page. So first and foremost, even as an individual, you're not dealing with anybody else in your mind, you need to know what's the big goal here. I've got all these little things that are going to vie for my time, but what's yeah. the big goal here? And so yeah. get that framework down and then write it down. So if you look at it, one of the more fascinating things of the research that we looked at was if you come up with an idea that you want to do something, if you have an idea, I want to win a gold medal in volleyball, you got a 10% chance to do that. Then all of a sudden when you commit to it, go, I'm going to win that. Like that's not just an idea. I'm going to do it. So you commit to it, 25% chance. Then you go, okay, now I'm going to write it down. So now you write it down. Then it jumps up into the 50% range. But you've written it down. Okay, now I'm going to share it with someone. Mm. Now you jump up to 65% chance it's going to happen. And then to get from 65 to 95, is it that person you shared it with or someone else, you then set up meetings to where they're going to hold you accountable for it. Mm-hmm. That could be a Zoom meeting. could be a coffee meeting. Once we're able to do that. But now you're 95% able to, to master that goal. And so a lot of it is really making sure that you commit to it, put it down, write it down. And then from there, each and every day, and this isn't stuff that we don't know, right? It's stuff that I just wanted to test to see if it worked for me and then look at the research. Does it work for other people as well? Right. Is then each morning you got to write down what's the one thing that I could do that makes everything else either easier or unnecessary. And so focusing on that one thing each and every day. And the research also showed us, and it worked best for me in the morning because you have less distractions. Mm-hmm. It's just knocking that thing out, committing that 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Not a ton of time a lot of times to do that one thing you need to do. And just making sure you get that done before the world gets crazy on you. And the beautiful thing I say, playing, you're playing with house money after that. Anything you do further for that goal later in that day, you're good. But it's like you don't save that important thing to last you don't start rocking your email first we're, we're attracted to do the easy things because our brain's wired to do that because it gives us a dopamine hit if we take our email from 100 down to zero and right. so we're fighting kind of our dna to make sure we focus on the more difficult the big things first and that's how you achieve big goals is by focusing on them first you know, you, you said something that we, we use often with the, the clients that we work with as well, is that what we're teaching you is not, um, it's not rocket science, it's common sense. Because what you're saying is common sense. It's just not typically common practice. And so like a great example of that is, well, how, how, how do you stay healthy? Everybody knows the secret recipe for staying healthy, right? You eat right and you exercise. Yet, you know, heart disease continues to be the number one leader in killing people because even though we know what it takes to be healthy, it's a different type of animal to be able to to actually go out and do it. And so you're talking about knocking things out in the morning. And I think about working out. So like, you know, if you, if you, I always feel better and I'm sure many people feel the same way when you, when you get up and you're committed to to doing something active, whatever that looks like for you, whether it's you're going to go take a walk or you're going to get on the bike or whatever it is, 
if I can do that almost immediately in the morning, I always feel like my day is, is always so much better. I'm more productive. I, I'm more, I'm more energetic. I, I get more stuff done. And to your point, you're, I feel like I'm playing with house money. It's not, I'm not losing because I've already got rid of what I needed to do in the morning from an exercise standpoint. Does that, does that resonate? Oh yeah, for sure. Like you said, it's uh, basically what we're telling you, especially the book is simple. Like you said, it's common sense. We call it simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. Mm -hmm. So it's really simple what we're giving you, but that doesn't mean it's easy. And what we're trying to say is like simple wins, but simple, not easy to do. Um, and so it's just, it's really fascinating when we look at it. Other things that really popped that, that helped me a lot was that most people have this image that successful people don't sleep. Like sleep when I'm dead. I can sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> when in fact it's the exact opposite that they know that sleep is a new leadership tool. Yeah. And so they actually go out of the way to make sure that their body and mind are rested. And so that their hours are more productive because obviously you might say, Oh, I'm losing hours if I'm sleeping eight hours instead of five. But the key is your hours are more productive by doing that. So that was another thing that jumped out, just the importance of rest mm -hmm. and that, and it's just fascinating. A lot of these top, leaders and you know as well as i do is that that they actually get up really early but they also go to bed early right yeah yeah i totally agree with that i, I think it was doesn't bezos say that he doesn't schedule any meetings before 10 because he knows how productive he is he likes his sleep first of all and he knows how productive he is before that time i think i read something that he doesn't schedule any meetings before 10 a.m and we when yeah, i was playing really, yeah I was just going to say, when I was playing on the national team, we actually had a sleep doctor. We had a specific doctor that was helping our team as we travel um, to become acclimated to time zones because we acknowledge, to your point, of how important sleep is to recovery as an athlete. It's paramount. It's huge. Yeah, and to Bezos, he has also a two pizza rule, meaning that if it takes more right. than two pizzas to fill, feed the meeting, then that's too big of a meeting. I want to make sure these meetings are more like platoons rather than armies. Yeah. Um, so there's stuff like that. Um, one phrase or mantra that I came across that now I've embraced is less but better. Mm. So do less. And by doing less, you can do it better, but less but better. Yeah. And then think not busy, think big. You want to avoid being busy at all costs. Because mm -hmm. um, there's a guy that did a lot of research and some of the most successful people in the world, and one commonality across all of them is that they gave time to think and reflect each and every day. What am I doing? Is that what I should be doing? Mm -hmm. How can I spend more time with my family? How can I be more successful? And so it gives you that time rather than just being go, go, go to reflect. I think that that's one of the gifts that's been given to us with quarantine is to take advantage of it. There's a lot of negative stuff, obviously, that comes with it. But there's some positive things that we need to not waste this time. Waste it from a standpoint of, okay, I've been given kind of the gift of more time. So I don't have to commute. I don't have to do, I'm not stuck in traffic. Um, I'm with home with a family, more family time. It's like, yeah. What's the positives I can take out of this? So that's why I think this this book and the focus stuff that we did is going to be really impactful for this time. It's awesome. Can you can you give an example or two where just for you personally where you feel like you've completely focused and and it ended up paying off big time for you in the end? Can you, like just an example? Yeah, so really nervous going into this project because I go okay, how can I afford to do this project? Obviously I have a company that I have to run an animation studio that obviously I speak on and write books. Right. So what's the one thing I have to take care of to allow me to do this project? Um, and when I say do the project, I was going to commit two hours a day for a couple of reasons. One, I'd had four false starts trying to do this. <laughs> like I'd had this idea <laughs> forever. And I said, and the first thing I needed to commit to was I've got to rock sales out that first month. We call it growth. So mm -hmm. for some people listening, whatever it is you need to grow, that first month that we want to do is we're going to focus on growth for two hours a day. 
Well, I had tried that four other times. And literally, I'd go, I got to focus on growth for two hours a day. And for the month, I would have committed 14 minutes because I was letting all these little things pull at my time. Mm -hmm. And so once we finally, once I was finally able to kind of drop the hammer and do it right on that fifth time, so to speak, in January, then by focusing on sales just one month, just one month, it gave us, it was metric because I want to see something, do something that I can metrically, you know, just measure. Right. And so that was why we picked that as well. But fortunately it worked because otherwise we'd have to scrap the book if it didn't. But I gave myself a grade of an A, and there's only two months that I gave myself an A for on the things we focus on. And that first month was an A because we had a record amount of sales, not only for that month, but it gave us a record, set us up for the year to just crush it for the year. So then that showed me the power. Okay, we're on the right path. If we just focus, like taking a magnifying glass, you know, until it's, if you just kind of didn't laser focus the sun's power, with that magnifying glass, it doesn't do anything. But once you take that magnifying glass, you can burn that hole. If you put it on that, that wall for a certain amount of time, it'll start to burn that hole. So yeah. um, that was helpful. Now, I'm trying to think of a month where I gave myself like a C. Because someone would hire, I think one of the months was mindfulness. So mm -hmm. trying to quiet the mind, trying to journal. And I gave myself a C because I dramatically improved so much better. But I also saw, saw how powerful it could be and if you get into research like the one way you can grow gray matter in your brain like increase your your basically brain power is through meditation yeah uh, and i'm the kind of guy that's like dude that's i remember the first time i did yoga and basketball I'm like why am i doing this this is like a waste <laughs> of my time and so that month i definitely was much better by the end of it but knew i had a lot more room to grow um, and journaling something that I know the benefits, I see it every time. And what I learned was, Hey, give yourself a break. Like I was trying to always write down this whole page of journaling. Like I just need to write a sentence. That's it. If that's all I write, that's fine. But just kind of do that as early in the day as possible, write out that one sentence. If you do more fantastic, but kind of give yourself a break. Yeah. Huh. That's great. Well, I want to, I want to switch gears a little bit and just get to know you a little bit. So let's, I'm going to do some rapid fire questions. These are just kind of like whatever the short answer or whatever answer you want to give, but, uh, love it. Uh, I know you do this too on, on your podcast as well. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what's, what's the trait you most dislike about yourself? I sometimes go into a hole to where I, I become an army of one. Uh, and so I know when I start to do that, I need to do the exact opposite. That success doesn't happen alone, that it happens with other people. And it's not just success. It always makes me feel better to make sure I spend time reaching out to people. So I'm like an introvert extrovert. I'm extroverted on stage, introverted off stage. And sometimes I revert too much to the introversion. That I just want to have my coffee. I want to be by myself and you need that time of right. reflection, but it's really, that's what I, I've got to do a better job at just making sure I continue to stay engaged with amazing people like yourself, with some of my tight friends that I grew up from high school up is just making sure I maintain those bonds. Yeah. I like that. That's a good one. You know, it's so easy to do that too. I think a lot of us can relate to that because you know, you can trust yourself, you know what you're capable of, but having to extend that trust to other people because trust is earned and given. Right. And so it's sometimes that's hard because you're like, I know what I can deliver here, but now I've got to, I've got to depend on some people to help me get to where I need to go. But at least acknowledging the fact that, you know, you, you're not going to get there on your own. I think is probably the first step in conquering the battle there. That's it. I like that one. Um, how about this? This is a tricky one. How about what's the trait you most dislike in others? Does anything just irk you? The one that pops in my head, so I'm going to say it is uh, selfishness. Mm -hmm. So that's probably it. It doesn't irk me. It's just more, I see that and I go, I've struggled with it myself. We all do like, no, it's perfect. And go, okay, I can see that in that person. How can I help that person? Yeah. What have I learned? And that's 
a little bit also back to focus. It's like your focus should be on others first. It's kind of tricky. You got to love yourself. So obviously self love, you can't love others if you don't love yourself. So you always want to love yourself first. Yeah. But then part of it is whenever I'm stuck in a rut is trying to avoid going in that whole army of one. And that's why I tell other people is like, go volunteer. Uh, Cause at least that time, then at least someone's benefiting from it. And guess what? 99% of the time both benefit because you're going to learn something. Yeah. I like that. Um, have you ever had any near death experiences? Uh, that was little I did, I guess. Really? I, mean, I, thought, I thought of a tree. And somehow my legs wrapped around with my brothers in the woods doing stuff we shouldn't do. <laughs> and I fell from pretty high up in a tree and my legs wrapped around a tree limb. Scraped the heck out of the back of my legs, but then I was just hanging upside down going, that was lucky. <laughs> so I guess that's the one that, that pops into my head. What about yourself? Oh, man. Um, so I had, uh, I don't know if this is near death. I'm trying to think. I didn't know you were going to turn it around on me. <laughs> I had, I developed MRSA. I had a staph infection on my leg. I got MRSA. And so that's, that's, that's oh my a gosh. fun thing. Yeah. I mean, you can, I don't know if you're going to, I guess people have died from it, but more likely it was you lose a limb. You know what I mean? And so luckily, yeah. luckily I was able to, to get it taken care of, but I still got a gnarly scar on the back of my leg. It looks like I got shot. It, it was, it was crazy. Wow. Yeah. Not, not fun. Wouldn't recommend it for people. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think your next great achievement will be? Or what do you hope it will be? I hope it's that my kids think I'm the greatest dad on the planet. So I have two daughters <laughs> at a perfect age right now. Eight and about to be 10. Oh, cool. And so it's so grounding to kind of always go back to that whenever I'm having a bad day. It's like, look, the number one job I have in this life because they got thing I need, I can be replaced. I'll get another speaker. There'll be another book written. The one job you can't be replaced in as a dad or a mom. Yeah. Like, you're irreplaceable. And so that always helps ground me. And so that's the ultimate goal. And that's the ultimate success. Um, yeah. In terms of, like, a, outside of that, I've got some crazy ideas. Like, I want to produce a Grammy song. Awesome. Harry Potter type book written, done. So next year we're trying to run, watch. Uh, so who knows? I can turn into movies in a theme park. I've always got the dream of being the next Disney. Not in terms of like, hey, I do this exact theme park movies, but just who has given so many smiles out? And you think about it. Presidents are famous, remember them, but everyone knows Disney. It always puts like a smile on most people's faces. And so how do you have that kind of an impact? That's cool. Um, these ones are quick here. Uh, dream vacation, where are you going? I haven't been to Israel, Japan. Oh. Those are all high on the list. But wherever I go, it's with the kids. It's awesome. Yeah. It's so much different. So you can be anywhere with the kids. Cool. Uh, name a movie where you teared up. Hoosiers. Oh, yeah. I get to me every time. I get yeah, excited. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that Angel one and Rudy. Pizzo's a great screenwriter. <laughs> Rudy, yep. It's the same writer, Angel Pizzo. Had a great guy, by the way. Awesome yeah. dude. I've been able to meet him a couple of times. Oh, sure really? He's a good dude. That's cool. But yeah, because I was a walk on. I was playing the whole morning story. I, I wrote that through their notes. They inspired me to make the team. And then he wrote me a note back. And blah, blah, blah. And, and then we started meeting up. And he's a huge IU basketball fan. I'm a big Michigan State fan, big 10 guy. So we're, just, we're always emailing during the season. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, all right, last one here. If you never got into speaking or writing or, or, you know, doing the work that you do with organizations, what ideally in your brain, what would you be doing right now? Ah, good question. You know, I always loved my jobs and my career. I think what I probably would have wound up doing if I was continuing on the path and was lucky and got successful, I'd probably be a CMO somewhere, hopefully for yeah. a private company. Um, but gosh, if it wasn't one of those, like vocationally, I'd love to kind of coach, not like the level you did, because I don't know if I'd be good at recruiting. Yeah, it's but, hard. <laughs> 
at like an individual level, I probably wouldn't mind just kind of empowering people somehow if it's fitness or whether it's just trying to help people some, some way, some, some form or fashion. Yeah. That's a good, yeah. I've always, you know, I like coaching junior high school or high school, something, you know, just to kind of give back and, you know, take all the knowledge I have in my brain and, and, and extend it to, you know, to try to impact some of those kids at their, at that time is that's a noble cause. All right, man, you passed the test. Those are good answers. Tell, tell everyone where they can find you or learn more about the work that you guys are doing. No, this has been great. Hopefully we can hug it out here soon. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on. Just to touch on it. Thanks to all your listeners. But yes, if I can help in any way, it's just equal, man. It's, it's spelled exactly how it sounds. I don't wear tights or wear tape, but we're trying to help empower people, but it's, equalman.com and then the new book coming out is called the focus project and that will be out june 22nd for sale um so it'll be wow. out soon i on this one so anyways uh a couple weeks that's exciting that's for you man thank you no we're pumped yeah uh all social media outlets people can find you all social, it's all equal, man. Yeah. Occasionally, if we didn't get on it early, I think uh, TikTok, we might be equal, man, official, but should be easy enough to find. And then you got your podcast as well, which uh, I know is a labor of love. Uh, and I've, I've listened to it, and it's, it, I, I really enjoy what you're putting out there, too. It's cool. If it, you know, these are obviously podcast people, so you want to make sure that they, they talk a little bit about your podcast. Oh yeah, you can find it at Super U Podcast, and it's just the letter U, like university. So Super U Podcast, and we're always trying to give out a lot of times seven tips and tricks that we've learned from other people. But the Super U Podcast, yeah, it's awesome. Well, again, Eric, appreciate you taking the time, man, out of your busy schedule, and good luck, uh, you know, getting everything back on track with the, the new normal, whatever that ends up looking like, and hopefully we'll be able to connect at some point soon in the future here no it's such an honor to be here ryan so good to hear your voice and again hopefully we get to uh fist bump and hug out soon in the meantime it's just digital fist bumps and digital hugs so i appreciate it yeah all the best my man thanks all right you too man good to hear you take care bye-bye